So hello and welcome everyone to the 2021 Bad Crime Writers Festival. Isn't it amazing to actually be in a room with people you're not related to? I think for my family, that might be a bit of a relief. I'm Sunil Badami and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Metcalf Auditorium at the State Library of New South Wales. And I welcome you too, all of you joining us on Zoom today from around New South Wales at your local library or at home, courtesy of your local library. We acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nations as the traditional custodians of this land on which we meet and talk. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and ask that you share with us respect for country. Now, dactyloscopy, it's, it's not the science of spotting flying dinosaurs, but the detection, classification and identification of fingerprints at crime scenes. It's been one of the mainstays of crime detection and prevention since the Henry classification system, which algorithmically categorized and identified fingerprints by their distinctive ridge, arch and whirl patterns and which was first proposed in the 1890s and was adopted by law enforcement around the world up until recently. But the former penal colony of Australia has also given the world a groundbreaking method of identifying fingerprints. And it has the fingerprints of these two world renowned experts all over it. <laughs> Please put your hands together for our guests. You can see where this is going, can't you? So why don't we uh, knuckle down and give the uh, ridgy didge world of dactyloscopy and fingerprinting a bit of a whirl? Hey? I'm a dad. It's what I do. Yeah. Okay. okay. Don't palm me off, please. All right. So before I introduce our guests, Claude and Chris, I'd like to make a few short housekeeping announcements. We all know the drill. We're following COVID protocols. So we're all double vaxxed. We've all checked in with our QR codes and we're all keeping our masks on except when we're eating or drinking or making bad jokes. Social distancing means that there are restricted numbers in the room. So please try to respect the protocols. There's hand sanitizer at the door. And please let a volunteer know if you're feeling unwell. Please turn off your mobile phones or put them to silent. And please don't record the session. But feel free to take photos. Just make sure you turn off your flash. And feel free to share on social media with the hashtag BadCrimeSydney21 at BadCrimeSydney. Now, please do be mindful of your fellow audience members and our discussion. And if you know that you have to leave the session before its conclusion, try and put yourself kind of on the edge near the door so you can slip out before without causing any disruption. And we will have ample time for questions after the discussion. Now, if you're joining us on Zoom, please send your questions through the chat function on the side of the window about 20 minutes before the end of the session and we will do our best to include them. So it now gives me very great pleasure to introduce our guests this morning. Professor Claude, Professor Claude Roux. Hello. Claude is Professor of Forensic Science and Director of the Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Technology Sydney where I also teach. He migrated to Australia in 1996 after completing his undergraduate and PhD studies in forensic science at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. He's been pivotal to the development of forensic science in Australia over the past 24 years by developing and leading the first undergraduate degree and PhD program in forensic science in Australia. He was the president of the Australian and New Zealand Forensic Science Society from 2010 to 2016, and he's the current president of the International Association of Forensic Sciences, a council member of the Australian Academy of Forensic Sciences, a fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales, and serves on the scientific advisory board of the International Criminal Court. Please put your hands together for Claude Roux. Thank you. Now, 
After a PhD in chemistry and forensic science from ANU and postdoctoral work with the School of Forensic Science at the University of Lausanne, Professor Chris Leonard worked for Forensic Services at the Australian Federal Police as the manager of Forensic Operations Support, where he was also chief scientist responsible for coordinating forensic R&D across the AFP's forensic portfolio. After a stint as Professor of Forensic Studies at the University of Canberra, he joined the Forensic Science Program at Western Sydney University in 2014. His research interests include the forensic analysis of trace evidence, the evaluation of portable equipment for forensic applications, and the detection of finger marks. But we'll talk about that in a second. And his work on fingerprint detection has been cited in nearly 6,000 academic papers, journals, and books around the world. Please welcome Chris Leonard. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So let's start with you, Claude, because you've got a little bit of interest in the history and philosophy of forensic science. What does the word forensic mean? Uh, that's a very interesting. So I'm sure you all, I mean, most people are interested in writing or writers in the room. So maybe they have some concepts of Latin. Uh, so it comes from forensis and it's related to the forum in antique Rome, which was the place where things were debated. So it's a very early version of a, of a court. Uh, and it's uh, essentially um, the immediate link would be that it's application of science in, you know, for court purposes or legal purposes. Um, now, this is, a, I would say, a very, uh, very limited, very narrow-minded uh, definition, because if you go back to what actually was happening in Rome, uh, it's not only a, a, it was not only a court, as we see it today, it was also a place where a lot of things were debated, things about security, about military, about society in general. So um, there is now a bit of a of a move in forensic science to see forensic science not simply as an application of science for legal purposes and, and court purposes and law enforcement, but um, more as uh, a full study of uh, what we call traces. Uh, and by using the informational content of these traces to help decision makers to make the best decisions, whether it's policy decisions, whether it's, um, you know, um, investigation decisions and the best way to um, to look at it now we've got the perfect example with COVID a lot of things that are happening that have pretty much happened for the last two years um, it's essentially forensic science you know, pretty much in the making because people try to make sense of a very complex phenomenon happen happening that is uh, dangerous to society uh, and you make sense of that through a proxy um, so we make because we don't we don't have a view on the virus itself, um, and then we have to make decisions how to how to you know prevent how to fight and and, and so on. Um, so it's a long 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 answer, but uh, essentially what I'm trying to say it's uh, it's more than just the application of science and technology to um, to solve crime. Uh, there is a, a dimension of of prevention. There is a a, a dimen dimension of a, of a proactivity here, uh, and really we focus on. Uh, the vestige, the remnants of our activity and presence. So everyone in the room, um, you know, you scanned your QR code, so you left a trace of yourself. Um, so essentially by looking at these traces, then we can link back to you. So this is essentially what we do in forensic science. That's really interesting. I mean, we do talk about contact tracing. What does the trace mean? I know that's an interest of, for you, Chris, about uh, tr trace evidence. What is trace evidence and how important is it to the concept of forensic science? I think there's probably two concepts there. When we talk about traces in general, we're talking about uh, information. We're, we're talking about something that can indicate what has taken place. So in the broad sense, uh, a trace could be a, a sign in with a QR code. A trace could be some information uh, on a mobile phone. Uh, a trace can be anything that can be captured, interpreted, and provide some information of what has taken place. So that's a general concept of trace. But we tend to mix that up with trace evidence as being something physical. So trace evidence can be a small amount of material, a trace amount of material 
that we can collect, analyze, and interpret. So for example, the, the fact that you've walked into this room and sat uh, on a seat, you will actually leave behind evidence that you're in this room. Uh, there will be trace evidence left behind. There'll be fibers from your clothing left on the seat when you leave. There'll be hair that, that you will have shed. We each lose 100, 150 hairs a day. Some of us more than others. Yes. Yeah. So uh, obviously uh, the hair root can give us DNA. Uh, if you touch a smooth surface, you can leave a finger mark. Uh, you will take with you evidence you're in this room. You will take with you uh, fibers from the seat. You will take with you carpet fibers from the floor. So that's the other term, trace evidence, meaning more a physical material in trace quantities. But the more general term, the trace is some information, it could be digital information that can provide uh, some evidence of some activity. So when did uh, forensic scientists first start identifying traces as potential clues, Claude? Look, I, maybe controversial here, but I, I think it started, you know, when humanity came. Because really, when you think, you know, the very, very early humans had to find food. And so they had to essentially, um, you know, find evidence or traces of where they could find that food. And, and maybe if they were tracking an animal. So you look at, um, you know, footmark of a, a given animal you want to hunt. Um, so, and that's forensic science. You make sense of, you know, what's this mark? It means someone was there. So who is this some, someone? When, where are they going? Uh, all these are, you know, forensic, forensic questions. Um, but it's probably not what you wanted to, <laughs> to hear. So I thought you were working up to the answer, Claude. <laughs> no, that, I mean, the, the answer is it, it, there is a long history of forensic science. So it's been more or less documented. It depends on the country. And so we start with the start of humanity. And then, you know, in every culture you have, um, you know, you have writing. People would say, oh, it started with this. It started with that. Um, I think what happened in... Um, you know, in antique Rome and, and these sort of periods uh, is very crucial. It's been the first, um, you know, really the first realization and pretty much um, the first writings about um, what we would call forensic science, including forensic medicine. For example, the one of the first documented post-mortem uh, was the autopsy of, um, of Julius Caesar. Um, and How did he die? <laughs> Uh, there was no CCTV cameras at the time, so I can't. <laughs> no, but you could well imagine, you know, it, in addition to that, yeah, I mean, there was probably, you know, a um, finger mark on the knife and um, maybe he was having a robe. So some fibers from his robe were transferred onto the knife blade. And you can imagine very interesting things. Yeah, it would have made for an exciting end to Shakespeare's play. Tell me, what was the first crime solved by forensic science? Uh, again, I mean, it's a... It's, it's pretty much a, <laughs> it, it can be very variable. I mean, there, there is an, an, um, a notion that it's something happened in, uh, in, in, in China. Um, you know, it, it's, I think it was the sixth of um, century, uh, but I'm not sure if it's really completely true. So what do you reckon, Chris? <laughs> I'm with Claude on that one. <laughs> so it, it, you can't tell us anything about the um, way that that crime was solved? Facts never made a story truer, Claude. <laughs> I think Chris has more and more on that one, no? Eyes on the sickle. Yeah. I, th I think it's actually yeah. Sunil's got all yeah. the detail on it. No, I was hoping you'd tell me. God, this is a very forensic discussion. We're just going to go through the questions again. All right. So, look, I mean, New South Wales, as many of you may know, is one has the biggest, the largest collection of criminal photographs and mugshots. Um, at the State Library and the Justice and Police Museum and State Archives. Um, an incredible resource um, that you should really check out. You can check out online or any of those books like Cooks Like Us and stuff like that. But how did people go? I mean, we usually, you know, we see those wanted posters in the Wild West and we can identify most people by looking at them, although it's been hard for the last two years because people keep coming up to me with their masks on and I go, well, oh, it's you, Hi. So how did we go from identifying people by their faces to fingerprints? I mean, it seems like an incredible leap from the obvious to the obvious. 
but you don't leave your face behind at a crime scene. No, that's true. So the question is, what evidence can we find at a crime scene that might indicate that a particular individual was at that crime scene? And obviously, we want evidence that has high power of identification. And it's through now more than a century of work or several centuries of work that have shown that fingerprints are unique and leave behind finger marks on surfaces that have been touched. So when did they first, you know, work out that fingerprints were so unique? That's another potentially long story. But if you, if you go back through history, uh, you can find finger marks in pottery from ancient Babylon. You can find finger marks on contracts from China in 300 BC. Uh, and then you've got work being done in the 1600s, remarking on the patterns that are formed by the friction ridges on the skin. Then you've got more work done in the 1800s, uh, particularly some work done in India in the, in the 1850s, where they were collecting uh, fingerprints off, uh, off the local population on contracts. And you had, for example, Herschel in the 1850s, who remarked how unique these fingerprint patterns appeared to be. And then we have more work done in the late 1800s that, that ended up proving the uniqueness of fingerprints and coming up with ways of collecting and identifying fingerprints. I mean, we take it for granted now that computers can kind of pick up all of those patterns, um, you know, so quickly. How did they classify and identify fingerprint marks um, in the 19th and early 20th century? Uh, in particular, there was some work done in the late 1800s by Henry, who was a, a British uh, citizen who uh, worked in India for a while and then ended up going back to work for the Metropolitan Police. And Henry came up with a classification system. Now, wh why do we need a classification system? Well, if you collect fingerprints off a large number of people, you need some way of dividing up your collection so that it's manageable. So he came up with a model that would subclassify fingerprints based on their pattern and based on other characteristics. So the first classification system was actually the Henry classification system in the, in the late 1800s. And that's still in use by some countries around the world, although computer systems now can obviously more easily categorize uh, fingerprints. Now, we seem to be kind of moving between the term fingerprint and finger mark. What's the difference, Claude? Yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and it's a push that has come over the last, say, probably 10 years. And, and people may say it's very pedantic. But I think it's very important because it goes back to the notion that when we left the, the image of the popular ridges we have on our fingers on, on an object or the crime scene, like Chris said, um, they, this is a, quite often an imperfect image because, you know, it's a transfer of the image. So it's a one-off transfer it's not something that we've repeatedly i mean criminals at the crime scene they are not going to try to touch the thing several times until they have a good fingerprint um so it's a one-off it's this notion of again trace that a, a trace is a one-off which is quite often imperfect it's not representatively transferred and so on so it's a mark uh the same thing we use the same sort of distinction you know when we talk about about shoe and say you know, for many years we talked about shoe prints, but now we prefer to talk about shoe mark when it's a mark found at the crime scene. Now, we keep the word fingerprints when we collect these images of popular ridges, if you want, in, in a well controlled, standardized manner. So, if, uh, to keep it simple, if you take, you know, take a, um, a person of interest, you want to have their fingerprints. So, uh, and you want to have very good images. So that would be fingerprints because you put them on file and you can, if you don't have a good, good, you know, a good print, you can retake it. If you have something found at the crime scene, you know, normally it's, it's a finger mark. I mean, going back to your point about, you know, the fact that criminals won't leave a perfect fingerprint at a crime scene, how much slippage in terms of interpretation is there between, you know, when a fingerprint, finger mark, analyst is going between, say, a fingerprint and a finger mark. Is there any potential for misinterpretation? Oh, you want to go, Chris? 
Again, yeah. that could be a very long response to that one. <laughs> but just to go back, I mean, a finger mark is is a, a chance impression from touching a surface. So it's it's uncontrolled, it can be variable in quality. Uh, as Claude said, a fingerprint is a comparison, good quality impression, normally with black printer's ink, uh, or even a, a live scanner, a scanner that can be used to scan the, the fingerprint pattern. So the reference fingerprint, we expect to be of high quality. The finger marks that we find at a crime scene can be of variable quality, going from really, really poor, can't be used for identification up to uh, finger marks that are it more easy, uh, easily uh, identified. Now it comes down to the computer system initially and then the examiner looking at the fine detail in those, in the finger mark and in the fingerprint. And we call the fine detail ridge characteristics. So it could be a ridge that stops. So it's a ridge ending. It could be a ridge that splits into two, we call that a bifurcation, or it could be a really, really short ridge or island. So we call those ridge characteristics. Now, historically, we would need about 12 of those ridge characteristics in a finger mark and then find the same 12 characteristics in the fingerprint to conclude that they're from the same person. But statistically, it's not as clear cut as that. It could be anywhere from eight up to say 16 might be the range you need to work in. So it's variable. Uh, we have computer systems that help us with the initial search to find potentially matching fingerprints in our database but this is where it's incorrectly portrayed on tv it is largely the fingerprint practitioner who must decide on the final identification it's not the computer that does the final identification um i mean we often talk about human error will there ever be a point where computers with ai and machine learning will start to make those determinations and what are the implications do you think in regards to justice or the legal ramifications of the computer making that determination yeah that's a interesting question um i know that there is more and more ai systems or people pushing for ai um, systems in, in forensic science hoping to remove um the human factor element if you want and and any any sense of bias or subjectivity and and the whole bias topic in forensic science is a very hot topic um i mean my view is uh, and I, I think chris will agree i mean um we, we can't get away with other human um so for very very good quality marks you know there are already systems where you can have pretty much you know good automation and, and and it works and to some extent it's what happens you know in the good old days when we could travel overseas very easily uh we would go through the smart gate um you know the, the facial recognition uh, you know work for most people and in these cases yes that's fine but um the marks are quite often of bad quality as chris said or or, or there, there are distortions and things like that so in these sort of cases um you need you need a human to make the final the final decision so i think the machines are here to as a tool to assist the human in making their decision but at the end of the day you know you no one really replaced the, the human brain and it's a bit you know it's a bit like in medicine you you have you know a lot of tools that can help a gp or or a surgeon to to do their job uh, but at the end of the day there is a, a human decision making that that happens so don't forget to share on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the hashtag Bad Crime Sydney 21 at Bad Crime Sydney. Now, the Henry classification system wasn't the own, wasn't the first big development in finger mark detection or identification. And in fact, Australia produced or helped to discover a finger mark detection system, uh, method that is used by pretty much every police force or jurisdiction around the world. Now, do you know anything about this particular method, Chris? A little bit, yes. Um, I think the method you're talking about uh, uses a chemical called indane dione. Now, that was a chemical that was discovered in the United States back in 1997, and it was proposed that this chemical could be used to treat paper surfaces and detect finger marks on the on the on the paper uh, the early research done on this technique around the world gave variable results some countries got it to work quite well other countries were unsuccessful in getting the level of performance that they were expecting 
So that was around the time that, that I was working in the federal police and Claude was established at University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, so we, we collaborated on uh, some research specifically here in Australia on this indane dione technique. And so we have several research students working on this. And we ultimately discovered that we could come up with a new formulation, which I think you're going to refer to as the Australian formula. But this came out of collaborative research between the Federal Police and UTS. And we discovered that we could add a zinc catalyst into our chemical formulation. And we now call this indane dione zinc. And this is a remarkably sensitive method for detecting finger marks on paper, for example, on documents. And that technique that was optimized here in Australia is now considered worldwide as the best single method we have available for fingerprint, finger mark detection on paper. So yes, it, it has significantly changed operationally the success rates for finger mark detection on paper. So where would be, um, can you tell me about any cases or crimes that have been solved or perpetrators identified as a result of, and I'm going to call it the Australian method because I can't say in Dandion very quickly. I can't give you specific casework examples, but I can tell you that uh, anecdotally, uh, the police services around Australia and indeed around the world are now detecting far more finger marks on paper than they had in the past. Uh, I was actually getting contacted and abused by uh, fingerprint practitioners because we've increased their workload. So the more finger marks they detect on submitted items, that's more work later on to try and identify those finger marks. So we're talking you know, possibly three, four times the number of finger marks that you would normally detect with previous methods are now being detected. Having said that, we still don't believe that we are detecting all of the possible finger marks that might be present. And that's why we continue to do research to develop increasingly more sensitive methods. I mean, in the case of a document that um, people might want to keep secret, there'd be like people handing documents to each other, you know, surreptitiously under tables, whatever. Um, how do you pass all of the kind of different finger marks that will be on one piece of paper? Obviously, there's, there's a, a filtering process in terms of isolating the better quality finger marks, the ones that are more suitable for identification purposes. And then depending on your investigation, you have a, a list of potential suspects that you can do direct comparisons against. Or if you don't know who may be involved, you would search the national database and it will come up with a list of possible candidates. So it's all about going towards the, the better quality finger marks initially and seeing what identifications you can come up with. But obviously, the more handled the document, the, uh, the harder it's going to be. We'll come back to the database in a second. But now, is it true that it's not only humans who have fingerprints and have been known to leave fingerprints at crime scenes? Call it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and, and we're very proud to, to, you know, to have koalas. <laughs> they are well known to uh, leave, you know, something very close to a finger, finger mark. Now, whether it's, you know, unrecognizable from a human, I'm, I'm not sure. I've, you know, never had any, any koala's mark or fing, koala's finger mark, you know, examination done. That's but, because they're such clever criminals, Claude. Yeah, yeah. We, you never see them. They're just hiding in the trees. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the great apes have finger marks, have fingerprints and can leave finger marks. So chimpanzees, gorillas can leave finger marks. But yeah, it's, a, it's amazing that koalas can actually leave a mark that looks like a human finger mark. And how can you tell the difference between a koala finger mark and a human finger mark? I've never actually done the comparison myself. And I haven't been in any, crime, any criminal investigations where a koala was a suspect. But it could, <laughs> obviously, if, if, uh, if there was a break and enter in a zoo, then you might have to try and uh, remove any finger marks that were left by some of the local inhabitants but otherwise in your normal crimes uh, the great apes or koalas aren't normally on your list of suspects now if you're watching us on zoom don't forget to put your questions into the chat so that we can try and ask them for you in a few minutes um so uh, look i guess the thing is is that having watched everybody knows 
you know, since Mark Twain first featured finger marks and fingerprints in uh, the Puddin' Bowl Wilson stories in the early 1900s, people have kind of worked out, you know, maybe you shouldn't be leaving your fingerprints at the crime scene. So how has, um, you know, how has finger mark or fingerprint detection changed, you know, given that everybody watches CSI and we're all experts in forensic science? Uh, this is a very interesting observation because, I mean, quite often, and it's, it's something we, we quite often have to fight when we apply for research funding because people think that, you know, finger mark detection is, it's very easy. It's just powdering. And, and anyway, no one would leave fingerprints, finger marks um, in the, nowadays because it's well known. It's in all TV movies and everything. I mean, there are a few factors. I mean, one, um, you know, quite often there is opportunistic crime or things that happens, you know, in, in the heat of the moment and and in you know you can you can think about you know domestic violence or, or things like that and in these sort of cases obviously people are not you know acting rationally and they're not going to take gloves and 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 wear gloves um then you've got cases where essentially you've got very dumb criminals and and you know they don't think about it um not koalas not koalas they are very good yeah um and then you've got situations where um, it's just the the activity kind of tend the, the you know the criminals to uh, take off their gloves. And the typical case is with thing, things with um, a sticky tape. It's I don't know if you've tried to handle sticky tape with gloves. Uh, it, it's not very convenient, and it's very easy again in the heat of the moment to just take off the gloves and do it quickly, and then without realizing it's too late. You know you've got you've got your mark here. So. So yes, we still find a lot of, you know, finger marks um, after all these all these years. Just going to add to that that your average criminal is not that intelligent, and the, even the ones that plan their crimes don't necessarily think it through. And I actually recall a case from Switzerland when I when I was there at the time that the the local police told us about that there was a, a person who uh, committed a break and enter and was aware of not leaving finger, finger marks behind. So before entering the premises, he took off his shoes and socks and put the socks over his hands, <laughs> did the break and enter, and then, then left. They obviously didn't identify him by his finger marks. They identified him by his bare foot, foot marks that he left <laughs> because he wasn't wearing any shoes and socks. So there's always evidence there somewhere. So you should keep your socks on. All right. it, it, it's not enough because you know you you would pick up stuff from the floor on your on your socks or you would leave marks from your socks in different places so i think it's better not to do any crime <laughs> okay <laughs> good point um i mean is it still possible to get away with crimes like you know murder or any other crime given the incredible technological advances of the last few decades i mean there are two very high profile um murder inquiries or missing persons inquiries going on in New South Wales at the time. And it seems incredible that they're searching for forensic evidence in properties that were last, you know, inhabited by persons of interest or the missing person decades ago. Is it still possible to get away with crime? And is it possible to detect any of those traces after such a long period? Is it possible to get away with crime? Well, there are there is unsolved crime, so clearly it is possible, uh, and it could be that evidence was there that wasn't collected, or the evidence that was collected was degraded, or that the wrong techniques were applied, or the interpretation was incorrect, etc. Um, most crimes are reasonably straightforward to solve, even serious crime, because there's generally a link, a link between the offender and the, and the victim, for example. Uh, or there's fingerprint evidence or there's DNA evidence or something like that. Um, but some of the crimes that are more difficult to investigate is when there's not an obvious link between the offender and, and the victim. Like the, the famous serial killers who got away with a, a number of crimes. The one, they got away with it because there was no obvious link. They were picking people at random. So that rules that part of the investigation out. No obvious link between the offender and the, and the victim. Um, Techniques are obviously getting better and better as we go. Uh, finger mark detection methods are getting better. DNA profiling methods are getting better. But there, there may still be crimes where the evidence wasn't collected properly, uh, wasn't handled properly, wasn't analysed properly, uh, wasn't, results weren't interpreted properly. So 
uh, as Claude said earlier about human factors, there could be mistakes made or someone might just get lucky that minimal evidence left behind that wasn't actually found and analyzed interpreted correctly. Can I just add, I mean, yeah, I, I, Chris is perfectly right. And I think the, the summary is, is kind of simple is, you know, there is no perfect crime and there is no perfect investigation. Um, you know, we're all humans and there are, you know, things can happen. And one thing I would add is, Quite often we have this notion that forensic science is, you know, the, the, the thing absolutely perfect to solve all these, you know, very serious crimes, you know, serial crimes and, and, and murders and things like that. Um, and it's the big breakthrough. Actually, you know, it's not the cases where forensic science makes the huge difference. It's the sherry on the cake, you know, in these cases. Actually, the cases where forensic science can make a big difference are, you know, all the volume crimes, all the things where there is no direct link, um, you know, because as it, it's, it's Chris indicated, I mean, we are lucky in this country where, you know, most, most murders, vast majority of the murders, there is, there is some kind of a link and a reason for it. So for the investigation, of course, the, the immediate circle uh, of the victim is, you know, is focused on and, and can lead quickly to a resolution. If it's not done quickly, then it's another problem. In other countries, you know, not to name the US, for example, where the murder rate is much, much higher and much more random, uh, it's, it's probably another story. So, um, so what do you think is the next big development? I mean, you know, we've, we've talked about the move from um, mugshots and anthropometry to... Uh, finger mark printing, um, fingerprint evidence, and then of course it became DNA. I wonder, um, talking, speaking about technology, I mean, uh, so much more crime seems to be online, you know, whether it's child pornography or selling drugs or cyber crime in terms of money transfers. How relevant do you think physical traces will be in comparison to, you know, um, cyber crime? And how, will, how, how can we apply those forensic techniques from the physical world to the digital? Look, uh, uh, you're, you're right. Uh, you, we, the, the digital footprint of the population is, is so huge. Even people who don't use, you know, computers or social media and, you know, just going through the gates at a station. Now you've got an Opal card or something and you leave your digital trace. Um, I think the, that completely expanded the type of traces we can get and analyze in forensic science. Um, I mean, we may think that digital forensic science is a bit like the new DNA, you know, what DNA was, you know, 30 years ago. It's completely changing the, the speed, the, the volume of the traces we have and, and uh, the, the nature um, of, the, of this sort of work. Um, I think the reality is it, it's always uh, going to be a, a combination. Um, you know, in most cases, there will be a combination, especially for very serious, serious cases or complicated cases. And, and there are some very famous cases, in, say, um, in Ireland in, a few years ago, where there was uh, a, a woman uh, started a relationship online and it ended up very badly uh, and, and she was uh, raped and murdered. Uh, actually, the, how they went back and traced back to, uh, to the offender, uh, it was all about digital um traces um but digital traces were not enough in, in themselves they were there was a need to link this then to physical traces and and trace of dna in that case in her bed sheet and all sorts of things um but the, the first breakthrough was digital so I, I i think you're right digital uh forensic science is really the new kids on the block which is revolutionizing a, a lot of things that we are doing but there will be always some kind of a of combination now, speaking of social media, I did, am I right in maybe recalling a famous case maybe solved or undertaken in Australia where a criminal posted a photo of himself on Facebook without his face and was identified, his fingerprints were identified from the photograph on Facebook? Yeah, that's correct. There's actually been a couple of cases around the world of that type where only the hand of the offender was visible and provided the image has enough detail, we can still extract, extract information on the uh, directly off the finger in that case. So there are at least two cases I'm aware of where that's happened. Yeah. 
So, of course, none of us here will commit crime. Okay, Claude and Chris, none of us will commit crime. But if you were, <laughs> maybe thinking of being able to evade all this technology and all these brilliant minds who can identify finger marks and fingerprints in any multiple ways on paper, on Facebook, wherever you go, what tips would you give to purely, we're not going to do it, but, you know, let's say someone's on a diet and they, they really need that ice cream, but they don't want to be fingered for it in the morning by their wife. Not pointing any fingers here. They just want a little bit of ice cream and they don't want to leave a trace and they've got their socks on. What would you recommend? I think we should probably ask a koala to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why don't we um, go to a few questions from you? We've got some questions here in the audience. And also, if you're on Zoom, please put your questions onto the chat and we will try and read them out for you. Will I read them out of you? Oh, okay, great. All right. So the, the gentleman up there in the great hat, so, sorry, I'll just, I should say, I should have done more housekeeping, shouldn't I? So, basically, what I'll do is I'll just repeat your question. So, if you yell it out to me, I'll repeat it for all of you at home or in the library on Zoom. So, uh, the question was, uh, we believe that there's now suggestions that uh, hair fibres at crime scenes may not necessarily be as reliable for evidence or identification. Okay, so I, I mentioned earlier, we each lose 100, 150 hairs a day. Uh, so hairs will normally be present. Uh, hairs can be collected, hairs, hairs can be analysed. Traditionally, hairs were compared using microscopy. So an experienced uh, microscopist would put the, for example, the hair from the crime scene uh, under a microscope and the hair from the suspect on a separate microscope and look at the the two images together and they would look at certain features to see whether or not there were features in common or there were differences. Uh, I think the problem has come from some examiners being too conclusive in terms of saying, oh, well, they match. Uh, so what does that really mean? I, I think the microscopy is good at excluding. So oh, well, there's some obvious differences. The color here is different to the color there or the, the scale patterns different or whatever. So I think it's a good technique to exclude someone as having left the hair. But if you can't exclude them, okay, that has some value, but it's certainly not conclusive evidence. Nowadays, we also have DNA. Now, if the hair root is present, we can do conventional DNA profiling. If the hair root is not present, and by the hair root, I mean, if I pull the hair out, I'm gonna have the hair root in the end. But if my hair just fractures and falls off, there won't be the hair root there. There is still another type of DNA profiling. It's called mitochondrial DNA, that you can still get some information on the DNA in the hair shaft. I think microscopy is still good as an initial comparison, but the, the issue has been some examiners being too conclusive in terms of what they state. But if you combine that with subsequent DNA profiling, then there is still space for hair evidence to be uh, a valuable part of an investigation. Uh, yep. So, so the question was, was what's the relationship between juries and forensic evidence? And the example was given, you know, a number of cases in the 1980s, most famously Lindy Chamberlain, where it may appear that sometimes juries may over rely or overvalue forensic evidence or sometimes even disregard it. Yeah, th this is a very interesting question. And it's a really uh, a topical and crucial question, especially when we apply forensic science for court, court purposes. Um, I think the difficulty for the forensic scientist uh, is when the forensic scientist has to communicate the findings, um, the scientist has to interpret these findings. It's quite often quite clear to them how, you know, how, to, how to do that, or at least there is a shade of gray sometimes and things like that. As a scientist, the problem is how is it understood by lay people? And to make it worse, uh, you know, the, the legal system doesn't help because, you know, the, in court, if I'm harsh, I would say it's a circus. If I'm a bit kinder, I would say, you know, it's all about rhetoric and arguments. And, and, and the scientist is, can't really tell everything they have 
uh, easily. They just tell their story and what they can say, answering questions. And the questions are completely biased right from the beginning because you have one party who will tell something, another party who will tell something else. And in the middle, you've got the jury trying to make sense about what, what, what's going on. So it's partly a, a, a difficult thing related to the, the legal system itself, partly a problem of communication and, and, and training of forensic scientists, how they communicate their findings. Um, and there is also a, a, a problem with you know, in recent years, we talk about the CSI effect that if everyone watching CSI and reading stories and they think they know. And because in CSI, you always have the, thing, the finger mark identify on the computer screen like that, or there is DNA in every case. If, if in that case, there is no DNA, so it's worth nothing, you know? So there is some expectations from the jury which have to, to be managed. So look, it's a, it's, it's a complex, complex issues. And, and I think, um, in terms of education and research, if we are serious about forensic science, we have to, um, you know, to consider that space very seriously. Um, Chris went to court many more times than me, so maybe we'll have a, <laughs> some, some stories. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, really good question. And it's one I feel really strongly about in that, you know, as I say to our students, you can be the world's best forensic scientist in the laboratory, but if you can't walk into court, and communicate your results in a way that a lay person, so someone without a science qualification can understand, then it, it's, it's pointless in that they will misinterpret what you're trying to say. So communication is, is absolutely critical. And the Chamberlain case was a, a good example of that in that tests that the biologists did were presumptive tests that could indicate the presence of blood. And then you have the court interpreting the results as being proof that blood was present. They're two different things, so it indicates a, a miscommunication. When we walk into court as forensic scientists, we have to play by the court's rules. Uh, we have to answer the questions that are asked of us. If we don't get asked the right questions, there's information we may have that never gets put across to the court. We can only answer questions. We can't give our own evidence in the way that we want to give it. So we're in a different world when we walk into court and there, and, and there is an ongoing issue of courts not interpreting forensic evidence correctly. And we need to do more research on that. I mean, given how interpretive it is, how has Australia, I know that there's a few high profile cases where there were questions about forensic evidence. Um, the Caroline Byrne case, um, the case that was featured on the on Snan recently about you know the young man who was convicted of murdering his girlfriend who was actually murdered by Eric Arthur, uh, Edgar Cook the infamous Perth serial killer how have we but it, there doesn't seem to have been as much kind of um I guess debate or d around issues with forensic evidence for at least 10 or 20 years in Australia um, that's maybe not completely. It depends who you listen to. Uh, you know, they they are they are critics of, of forensic science. Um, you know, in, in many countries, including in Australia. And and I must say, I'm I'm not necessarily against these sort of critics. I, I think I think it's a it's a way to improve. Um, you know, we 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 can't really uh, rest on our laurels. Um, but I think it's it's true that overall, if you look at you know, what happens in, in other countries, I think we should, you know, throw away the, the baby with the bathwater. I, I, I think the level of forensic science by and large in, in Australia is really, really, really good. And um, I'm, I'm not saying that you are not going to find a very, you know, big problematic case here and then. And when that happens, it's, it's absolutely terrible. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, if there is a miscarriage of justice, it's absolutely terrible. Um, but but overall, uh, I, I think we we are quite innovative in this country in terms of in terms of R and D, uh, in even in terms of delivery of, of forensic services. So there, you know, there are some variations between jurisdictions, but uh, you know the, the the leaders are really doing you know very innovative approach to forensic science, looking from a very holistic viewpoint and good integration with intelligence, good integration with with investigation. Um, so. But I, I, I think they, a lot of the criticisms we've heard uh, over, over the years, um, you know, started from, from the US, um, where they have a very specific 
are probably a series of specific problems in the first place, and it resonated, you know, e everywhere. So then we try to find the same sort of problems here. And, and I'm not saying they don't, don't necessarily exist, but not at the same at the same level, put it this way. Now we've got a question from Zoom. How has the issue of transferred DNA affected the solving of crime? What is transferred DNA? I presume that's when you secrete or excrete something or? Well, we, we have DNA on our fingers uh, just naturally as, as, uh, as our hands dry out, we lose skin cells, the skin cells fall off. So in a finger mark, there can be DNA as well. So. Uh, not only can we detect a finger mark, but we can often extract the finger mark and get DNA and profile the DNA. But the problem of trace DNA it gets transferred very easily. So if I shake your hand, I have your DNA on my hand. I could go and commit a murder next door and your DNA could be found next door. You were not next door, but I, there was transfer of DNA. We call that secondary transfer. So this is one of the problems of some of our techniques becoming too sensitive. DNA profile now, profiling now is extremely sensitive. You only need a couple of skin cells to get a DNA profile. But that means we're now measuring background levels of DNA. DNA is everywhere. Uh, if you're touching uh, uh, the seat that you're sitting on, you may well pick up DNA from the last person that was sitting there. So you've got someone else's DNA on your hands. You touch a handrail, God knows what's on the handrail, but the that's going to give you a mixed seat. DNA profile. But we are so sensitive now, we're getting down to really, really low levels. And this issue of transfer and secondary transfer, tertiary transfer is a real problem. And the problem is in the interpretation of the result. So I detect your DNA at a murder scene next door. That's probably the correct forensic result. But we need to interpret that. How did your DNA get there? That's the question. It's nerve wracking, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so we'll just ask that question for everyone at Zoom. Um, we have a few crime fans here who have seen on TV where people have taken a fingerprint from a glass with sticky tape and then transferred it to another surface. Now, how would you know, Chris and Claude, that was the perpetrator's fingerprint or it was placed with sticky tape? It is possible. Uh, so, for example... Um, if I follow someone into a bar and I see them drinking at the bar and leaving their glass behind, if they've left a good quality finger mark on that glass, and I can tell by just looking at it, I can have a torch and I say, okay, that looks like a pretty good finger mark there. I could take adhesive tape, put it over the finger mark. The adhesive tape will lift off the finger mark. I could go to another location and deposit that finger mark on another surface. So I've transferred a latent finger mark from one surface to another. Again, we can detect that finger mark, we can identify it, but how did it get there? Now, we actually have looked at what uh, we can see in the transferred finger mark that indicates that it's not genuine. For example, you get things like air bubbles that are formed due to the adhesive tape. Uh, there will be uh, there'll be artifacts created that should raise a suspicion. From, so the fingerprint practitioner should look at that and say, well, there's something not quite right there. So from the studies we've done, there are indicators that that is not a genuine finger mark. That's a, that's a fabricated finger mark. It's been transferred from one surface to another. Would you also pick up the person who used the sticky tape? Because I've been wrapping Christmas presents and I reckon I've got fingerprints all over the place. <laughs> Well, if they're wearing gloves, you may not pick up their finger marks, but you may pick up their DNA. Uh, even if you're wearing gloves, you've got to, you tend to have the habit of touching your face or whatever while you're wearing the gloves. So on the outside surface of your gloves, you have your DNA. So we may see glove marks and that would tell us, okay, we're going to swab at those locations and we still might pick up the DNA from that individual. And, did you, and do, you, do you have daughters or, yeah? So, so chances are maybe you might have some glitter from them that has transferred from the, you know, from the gloves to the crime scene. <laughs> I feel so paranoid now. Can I just say, if either of these two come to your house, make sure you dust first. All right. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm, I, we are we are running out of time, so I, I I will wrap it up. I do have one more question from Zoom. Tell me, um, have either of you written a book? about your exciting lives as forensic scientists? And if not, when is it coming out? Question from Zoom. Uh, I have definitely not written a book about my life as a forensic scientist. 
I have co-authored a textbook on fingerprint detection and identification, but that's not my life story, no. <laughs> and what's the title of your book on finger mark detection? Uh, fingerprints and other ridge skin impressions. Catchy title. <laughs> Catchy title. Well, thank you so much for your great questions, everyone. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of you. I'm sure that if you um, buy Claude and Chris a coffee outside, you'll be able to ask them or interrogate them further. I would say to you all, make sure you keep your noses clean. But as we all know, the only thing you'll find in a clean nose is fingerprints. <laughs> 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 Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> Please join me in thanking Claude and Chris for such an enlightening and entertaining conversation. Now, even though you may have a day pass, please leave the auditorium at the end of the session, even if your next event is here, as it needs to be clean. And if you need any more info about that, just ask one of our friendly volunteers. Don't forget to check out the festival's other events at badsydney.com and share on social media with the hashtag badcrimesydney21 at badcrimesydney. I'll be back on Sunday talking to Mark Dappen about his book, Prison Break, featuring some of Australia's most wanted criminals and a few of the unwanted ones as well. Don't forget you can get tickets to more events at the festival reception table opposite the Library Cafe. Enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>